even though we've never directly discussed it. Up to this point, we've been dealing with circuits, we've actually only been utilizing what are known as ideal batteries. And these are batteries that behave in a somewhat simplified manner. But by understanding the concept of internal resistance, we're actually going to see that this behave in a slightly more complex way. But before we discuss that, let's make sure we understand what a battery is. So a battery is a device that converts chemical energy to electric potential energy by harnessing a chemical reaction within the battery. Now, I'm going to go ahead and tell you, we're going to go over a little bit of the detail, but I'm not going to go into much. Really, this is more a chemistry discussion than a physics discussion. I just want you to have somewhat of a bare bones understanding. So let's say I've got two types of batteries here. This one on the uh, left is known often as a lead acid battery, but essentially it's a car battery. And this one on the right is what is known as a dry cell battery. Um, but this would be like, for instance, your triple A's, double A's, nine volt, anything of that manner. So what exactly goes into these and how do they operate? Well, both types of batteries have two different metals. They're connected to the terminals of the battery. For the lead acid one, there are these alternating sheets of lead dioxide and lead that are connected to these terminals in such a way. And for the dry cell, you've got, it looks like a carbon rod on one side and a zinc casing. And those are, notice these metals are separated within the batteries. Now, they have to be different because they need to be able to interact with charges in various different ways. And these metals in each battery are separated by what is known as an electrolyte solution. Now, essentially what that means, it's a solution that allows ions to flow, particularly in one direction. Now, for the lead acid battery, we've got sulfuric acid, a liquid inside of it. And so essentially you can have uh, ions really going from these positive plates to the negative plates going through the lead acid. And for the dry cell, we have this paste in the middle. This is actually why it's called a dry cell. It's not a liquid inside. It's more of like a, like a peanut butter like substance. And so you would have basically uh, charges, positive ions going from the carbon rod to the zinc on the outside traveling through that paste. Now, this does not happen spontaneously. In fact, they will just kind of sit and nothing will happen until you hook a circuit up to it. And when we connect a circuit to it, essentially this is going to start the flow of the ions through the battery, and simultaneously it's going to start a flow of electrons through the circuit as chemical reactions are happening at both ends of this metal. And this is going to continue to go until eventually the reactants are used up, and at that point the chemical reaction stops, and we say therefore that the battery dies, because it can no longer provide any more energy. Now we're going to take a little brief detour for a second, but I want to bring up a question that might have popped up in your head at some point in time when we were talking about Ohm's Law. Which is if we look at this, you know, when we've dealt with batteries before, you've got the battery has a certain voltage and you hook it up to a resistor and boom, you can calculate how much current will be flowing from the battery through the circuit. But if we look at this, there's a little bit of an odd situation because we know if we have very, very low resistances, we're going to have big currents, right? Like if we have no resistors and we have just a wire in the circuit, you're going to get a very large current as you start to short out the battery. But the thing is, though, is that if R goes to zero, as it gets smaller and smaller and smaller, the current will essentially go to infinity. And so if we have a small enough resistance, this is basically saying that we should be getting practically infinite current. Now, we know that that's not realistic, but even considering the somewhat more realistic case, what does it make a whole lot of sense that we could get more and more and more current out of a single little battery if we don't have enough resistance there? Well, no. So what exactly is happening to try to limit this and prevent there being these, you know, humongous currents that realistically we shouldn't expect? But what is really producing that flow of charge? Well, it's the battery, and that is going to be limited by the rate of the chemical reaction in the battery. It takes time for this chemical reaction to take place, and if it takes time, that means it takes time for the charges to be produced, and therefore, well, we can't just get an infinite number out instantaneously. So let's kind of look at this for a second. I've got a four pretty much identical circuits. I've got a battery hooked up to a resistor, and just all that's happening from left to right is I've got a big resistor here, and I'm going to basically put in smaller and smaller and smaller resistors in its place. And let's kind of see what happens. Well, initially, let's say this is a 1.5 volt battery, okay, that we've hooked into the circuit, and we get 0.01 amps of current 
It's only a fairly small current. Now I'm going to replace that resistor with a smaller resistor. When I do that, I would expect the current to go up, and the current would go up here, and it would even go up here, and we see, in fact, that that is the case. As the resistor gets smaller and smaller and smaller, the current gets larger and larger and larger. But let's say you were to take a voltmeter and then go up to the battery and measure the voltage across the terminals as this was happening. Well, you might think to yourself, well, it's always going to be 1.5 volts, right? That's what the battery is set at. You know, that's what we said here. It is a 1.5 volt battery. And you'd be somewhat surprised to see that that's actually not the case. Because when I connect it here, it only comes out to be 1 volt. And when we have a smaller resistor with a bigger current, it actually only comes out to be 0.5 volts. And when I replace that with a smaller resistor and I get a bigger current, it actually goes all the way to zero. And in fact, at this point when this is zero, well, the battery cannot provide any more at this point, because what is happening here is that we are basically harnessing charges as quickly as they are being produced. So the potential difference across the battery is essentially vanished, because you're moving charges so quickly that that separation cannot be maintained. And so this is the point that we would call maximum current. That is when the maximum current would occur. So what we've noticed is as the current in the circuit increases as the current being pulled from the battery increases the voltage measured across the battery decreases so this is what we're used to seeing we're used to seeing a battery with some voltage delta v connected to some resistor and we would say that this is and this is what we've pretty much been dealing with so far this would be what we call an ideal battery it's a constant source of voltage it doesn't matter what current i pull from it the voltage will always stay the same but the thing is, though, is that this is not very realistic. And if we just talk about what we just did, that the current increases, the voltage across the battery decreases, well, we might start thinking, this sounds a little complex. Thankfully for us, there's a very, very, very useful model of what is happening here. And I want to be clear, it is just a model. It's not physically what is happening, but it's giving us a physics way to try to analyze a more chemistry-based problem. So what I've got here is I'm going to say I'm going to treat my battery as if there's a little resistor inside of it. And we're going to call that an internal resistor. So just to make sure you see what I've done here, this was the original situation, I basically replaced my battery with this entire box here. So I have, this is the quote-unquote real battery, and these are the terminals, like the positive and negative terminal, we'll say A and B. And I've got inside of it the same battery symbol, but we're going to say I've got a little resistor inside. So let's talk about everything that's going on here, because we have a bunch of new symbols, V, A, B, little r, and this epsilon, and what exactly each of one of these represents. Let's start with the little r. The little r is what is known as the internal resistance. Essentially, it is the resistance of this resistor that we put inside of the battery, and the unit would be in ohms pretty typical. Okay, now let's look at the other two symbols we have here. Let's start with the epsilon. The epsilon is something known as electromotive force, which is often abbreviated also as EMF. So you can use EMF or you can use this curly QE here. And this is the voltage across the battery when no current is being drawn. Now, one thing we should pretty much notice is that, notice this is a voltage, not a force, which is frustrating because it's called electromotive force, and that's really just a misnomer. It's a very, very antiquated term that's just never been changed. So when we hear electromotive force, we really just mean voltage, and specifically, it's the voltage across the battery when there's no current, or in other words, the voltage when the battery is just by itself. It's not connected to anything, and the unit will be in volts. And then lastly, I have VAB, and VAB is known as the terminal voltage, so the terminals being A and B, and this is the measured voltage across the battery as current is flowing. So as I have this current growing across here, this terminal voltage would be what I'm really measuring between A and B if I put like a voltmeter up against it. Now let's go through a bit of an example together to kind of see how exactly this operates, and then we're going to start noticing some trends and some conceptual details that we want to make sure we have down. So let's say we have this basic circuit set up. So, okay, keep in mind, remember all the pieces. This is just the battery, but this battery can be modeled as having this electromotive force here 
and an internal resistor, and it is connected to, we'll say, one external resistor. So specifically, we have a 9-volt battery with an internal resistance of 1 ohm. And we want to determine the current going through this circuit and the terminal voltage if, one, nothing is connected to the battery, two, if this R is 8 ohms, and three, if this R is 4 ohms. So let's start off the first situation. Well, the first situation is there's nothing connected to the battery. So I really just have a battery here not connected to anything else. Well, what would the current be? Well, there's no circuit. So if there's no circuit, the current is just going to be uh, zero because it is open. There is no current flowing. Now, what is the terminal voltage going to be? What would you measure if you put a voltmeter up between the terminals A and B? Well, remember the definition of what electromotive force is. Because this 9 volts here, when it says 9 volts on the battery, that's actually telling you the electromotive force, and specifically telling you how much voltage there is between the terminals when no current is flowing. So, therefore, by definition, the terminal voltage is the electromotive force in this situation. It will simply be 9 volts, because no current is being drawn. Now let's look at the second example when R is equal to 8 ohms. Well, okay, let's talk about how to do this. So let's first figure out the current. And what we're going to essentially do is we're going to pretend like this little box containing the battery, let's just pretend like that's not even there. And if we were going to solve this problem like we have many, many times before, we would look at this and go, okay, well, to find the current, we would just use Ohm's law, and we would use the voltage, and we would use the resistance. Well, the voltage, if we pretend this box isn't here, the voltage is just the electromotive force, the EMF. And the resistance would be, well, I've got this little resistor in series with this big resistor. So I would have epsilon over R plus R. And let's plug in our numbers. I would get 9 volts over 8 ohms plus the internal resistance was 1 ohm. So 9 volts over 9 ohms gives me a current of 1 amp. So the current going through this circuit would be 1 amp. Now, there's a couple different ways we could find the terminal voltage. Because if I want to know the voltage between point A and point B, well, there's a couple different ways I could do it. First, let's look at the terminal voltage going this direction, going around. Well, the only thing that's causing a change in energy or a voltage here would be this resistor. So I can basically just use Ohm's law for that resistor to find the voltage of that resistor. I use the current times its resistance. I get 1 amp times 8 ohms, and I get 8 volts. So we would say the terminal voltage between those two points should be 8 volts. Now there's another way we could go about doing it. Let's instead say I'm going to go this direction, because whatever the voltage is here would be what I would measure. So I would have the EMF minus, well, the voltage of this little resistor. Basically, I'm gaining energy here, losing energy here. So I would have epsilon minus the voltage of the little resistor. So that would just be epsilon minus the current times the little resistance using Ohm's law. So that would be 9 volts minus 1 amp times 1 ohm. Well, that'd be 9 volts minus a volt. Still gives me an answer of 8 volts. So the terminal voltage is 8 volts. Either way I go about it, I get the same answer. Now let's look at the third example. Let's say that we exchange that 8 ohm resistor for a 4 ohm resistor. And when we do that, we're going to go about pretty much the exact same method. So to find the current, I'm just going to use Ohm's law, but specifically I'm going to say the EMF of the battery over R plus R, but big R is now 4 ohms rather than 8 ohms. So we get 9 volts over 5 ohms, or 1.8 amps. And additionally, if I look for the terminal voltage, remember there's a couple different ways I could do it. One, I could say, well, what is the voltage across this resistor? And that would be the current times its resistance. So that would be 1.8 times 4, which gives me 7.2 volts. Or I could find the voltage between the points here. And that would be epsilon minus the voltage of the little resistor. So that would be, what, 9 volts minus 1.8 times 1, so 9 minus 1.8 gives me 7.2 volts. Either way, it works out. But let's notice a couple things here. Um, initially, you had an 8 ohm resistor, now we have a 4 ohm resistor. So the resistance between these two situations, specifically example 2 and 3, the resistance went down. And when that happened, the current went up, as we would expect. We went from 1 amp to 1.8 amps, and the terminal voltage went down. Originally, with 8 ohms, it was 8 volts. Now it's only 7.2. 
too. So as the current increases, the terminal voltage decreases. And the way to conceptually think about that here is remember, as we increase the current, we're increasing the amount of voltage lost in this internal resistor. So if we measure the terminals on the outside, we're gonna get a smaller and smaller value. So what are some trends that we notice going through this example that will help us analyze systems with batteries of internal resistance? Well, the first one is that Ohm's law still applies all of the time. but We just have to know how to apply it properly. We now have two different forms of it. One is I is equal to epsilon over capital R plus little r, and one is I is equal to VAB over capital R. And let's remember what all these terms are. So epsilon is the EMF, the electromotive force, VAB is the terminal voltage, little r is the internal resistance of the battery, and big R is what I would call the external resistance. Or in other words, it's just the resistance of the circuit, the resistance of whatever is connected to the battery. So if we're looking at the terminal voltage, we just use whatever is connected. But if we are looking at the EMF, you have to also consider the little r from the internal resistance. Now you'll notice, though, is that I have a lot of terms here in you know common, so is there some way I can directly connect EMF and terminal voltage into a single equation, and in fact, there is. So let's start with this equation here, I is equal to epsilon over big R plus little r. And let me go ahead and uh, multiply this across, and when I multiply it across, I'm going to get I big R plus I little r equals epsilon, and I'm going to move this I little r over to the other side, so I get big I big R equals to epsilon minus I over little r. Well, what is this big I big R if I look here? Well, that big I, big R would just be the terminal voltage. So I can replace that, and I now have a singular equation that the terminal voltage is the EMF minus the current times the internal resistance of the battery, which makes sense because it's the EMF minus whatever voltage we lose just in that little resistor. So let's take a second and keep in mind that whenever we're dealing with internal resistance, oftentimes we're dealing with very realistic scenarios when we might be taking data, we might be doing some sort of lab. And so keep in mind we have this equation VAB equals epsilon minus IR. And let's say that you were changing the current in a circuit. And if we were changing the current in a circuit, probably by adding different amounts of external resistance, how exactly does that directly affect the terminal voltage? And we can actually graph this. So we've got VAB equals epsilon minus IR, but let's make this into a form we're more familiar with, which is like Y equals MX plus B. And so I'm going to move over um, basically my IR in front, and I'm going to rearrange them because I is really my X, and VAB is my Y. So if we look at this, we notice a few different things. First off, this is just the equation for a straight line, specifically a straight line with a negative slope and a positive y-intercept. So we should be getting something that looks like this. And let's look at all the little pieces we could get from this graph in particular. Well, the first one is that the slope is just little r. It's the internal resistance of the battery. The next thing would be that, oh, let me be careful, the minus the slope. So I should really say that it will be minus the slope is the internal resistance. We can multiply it by minus one. The y-intercept is the EMF because that's the point when current is zero. When current is zero, VAB and EMF are the same thing. So that makes sense. What about this other intercept right here? What is this? Well, that's going to be our maximum current. And our maximum current will occur when? Our maximum current when VAB is equal to zero, when the terminal voltage is zero, we have reached the point of maximum current. So that is when VAB is equal to zero. But additionally, if I look at this equation here, if VAB is equal to zero, then I am left with minus RI plus epsilon is equal to zero. So these are going to be what? Equal to each other. I'm going to get epsilon is equal to IR. Okay, so let's do one final practice problem, just kind of making sure we have all the pieces in place. And then we're going to wrap things up. So we have, once again, a setup just like we've kind of seen before. We have a battery that is measured to have a 12 volt voltage when it is not connected to anything. So I have that battery by itself. I measure 12 volts with a voltmeter. And then when I connect it to a 5 ohm resistor, so this is 5 ohms, when I connect it to that, its measured voltage, I take the voltmeter again, I hold it up, its measured voltage becomes now 8 volts. 
And we want to determine a few different things. We want to know what is the EMF, the electromotive force of this battery. What is the current that occurs when we have the 5 ohm resistor hooked up? What is the internal resistance of the battery? And what is the maximum current that we could get from this particular battery? So let's go through all the details. Go try it on your own. Come back. Let's see how you did. And then we'll go from there. Hopefully you gave it a shot, because I really want to make sure you can understand every individual piece here. So let's start with the electromotive force. Well, the electromotive force, that is the voltage when the battery is not connected to anything, which you were just given. So by definition, we know that the electromotive force is just 12 volts, because this is a 12-volt battery. Boom, have it automatically. I'm done. Okay, so we've got that piece right there. Now, how do we figure out the current. Well, the current, you know, I don't have the internal resistance yet, so I can't use, you know, the current, use Ohm's law with this piece. I'm going to need to use Ohm's law with my terminal voltage and with the 5 ohm resistance. So I go ahead and head that up that the current will equal to the terminal voltage over this external resistance, so I get 8 volts, because that is what we measured when we had 5 ohms going through it. Divide those out, you get 1.6 amps. But now that I have that, I can figure out the internal resistance by using the equation VAB is equal to epsilon minus IR. And I'm going to rearrange this. So I'm going to what? I'm going to move the epsilon across, and I'm going to divide by both sides by negative I. And when we do that, we get epsilon minus VAB over I. Those flipped because of the divided by minus 1. And now I'm just going to plug in my numbers. I have 12 volts minus 9 volts. And, oh, that is an error. This should be minus 8 volts. There we go. Minus 8 volts over 1.6 amps. I'm pretty sure I still calculated that right. Is equal to 2.5 ohms. So 2.5 ohms would be the internal resistance of the battery. And lastly, how do we figure out the maximum current that we could pull from this battery? Well, the maximum current occurs when the terminal voltage will be equal to 0. So if I set that into this equation, 0 is equal to E minus I max R. Well, I max will simply be what? Epsilon divided by little r. And we do that, we stick in 12 volts over 2.5 ohms, and we get a current of 4.8 amps. The maximum current you could get from this is 4.8 amps. You'll never get infinity. If the resistance gets too small, it will max out at this number, 4.8. So that concludes this lesson on batteries and internal resistance. Can we compare how ideal batteries that we've been dealing with up to this point and real batteries operate in different ways as the current through them increases? Keeping in mind that the ideal battery, the voltage will be constant. A real battery, that terminal voltage will decrease as the current increases. Can we model a real battery as having an internal resistor to explain why there is such a thing as a maximum current that you could draw from a particular battery? And lastly, can we utilize different forms and combinations of Ohm's law, so the two different forms of it, as well as VAB equals epsilon minus I little r, to calculate the electromotive force of the battery, the EMF, to calculate the terminal voltage, VAB, to calculate its internal resistance, little r, maybe the current being drawn from it, and even the maximum current that a particular battery could provide.